When white opens the game with e4, black's most classical continuation is to respond in kind with e5. The central struggle continues after knight f3, developing the knight and adding pressure against black's e5 pawn, so black actively develops while defending the center with knight c6. Bishop b5, known as the Rui Lopez, is one of white's most established and classical responses debated at grandmaster level for centuries. In this video we are going to focus on another opening with a rich history and sound strategic basis, developing the light squared bishop to the active a2 to g8 diagonal with bishop c4. The bishop enjoys an active diagonal, pointing at black's weakest point on the chessboard, the f7 square. If black plays the natural knight f6, known as the two knights defense, this provokes incredible complications after knight g5, piling up pressure against the weak f7 pawn, the subject of another video. To discourage knight g5, black occasionally wastes time with the dubious h6, or develops the dark squared bishop to the somewhat passive e7 square. Both of these moves are well met by striking in the center with d4, developing a strong initiative for white. We're going to focus on black's straightforward, solid response bishop c5, actively developing the dark squared bishop and fighting for control over the d4 square. Notice that knight g5 is not possible as this would simply hang a piece to queen takes g5. If white decides to play d3, supporting the center and opening up the dark squared bishop, this can be met by the natural developing move knight f6. There is clearly nothing wrong with white's solid d3 move, but white is mistaken if it is followed up by knight g5, intensifying the pressure against f7. When you first see this line as black, it can feel pretty intimidating, but black has nothing to fear after castling the king. The point is that if white continues with the premature attack knight takes f7, after rook takes f7, bishop takes f7 check, and king takes f7, black's king may feel a little exposed, but where are white's attacking pieces? White has wasted time to exchange two minor pieces for black's rook and pawn. Although this exchange may be considered approximately equal from a materialistic perspective, the quality of black's pieces promise a more comfortable game. Black already has three active minor pieces developed, enjoying a significant advantage in time. During the early phases of the game, the knights and bishops are easier to handle, as it takes some time for the rooks to find open lines for development. One basic plan for black is to complete development with d6, supporting the center, and allowing the light squared bishop to enter the game quickly with bishop e6 or bishop g4. Black's rook may visit the f8 square, so that once the king returns to g8, black's rook can enjoy activity down the f-file. This impatient approach is not a good choice for white. When beginners take their first steps in the game, they are advised to rapidly develop, castle quickly, and focus on controlling the center. Countless games have been played in the following way. Knight c3, knight f6. Both sides have dutifully developed their minor pieces toward the center. This is usually followed up by quickly castling. When white plays d3, supporting the center and possibly preparing a pin with bishop g5. Sometimes black follows suit with d6, but may also decide to prevent the pin with h6. White may confront black's bishop with bishop e3. Notice that white is not afraid of allowing doubled pawns with bishop takes e3. F takes e3. White's e3 pawn helps support the center, while also opening up the f-file for white's rook. When appropriate, this pawn may also help white expand in the center with d4, so there's a lot more to this story than assuming white simply has weak doubled pawns. Rather than capturing on e3, black can maintain the tension with bishop b6. Encouraging white to capture on black's terms with bishop takes b6, opening up the a-file for black's rook. White may continue with the plan of general development with queen d2, supporting the bishop and connecting the rooks when black may follow in similar fashion with d6, possibly preparing to activate the light squared bishop with bishop g4. So white can play h3, preventing bishop g4 when black may decide to activate the bishop on the e6 square, confronting white's light squared bishop when white may also maintain the tension with bishop b3. After queen d7, we have reached a symmetrical position in which both sides may focus on centralizing their rooks on the d and e files. This is a common way for both sides to play with a basic understanding of opening guidelines. Perhaps you've seen or even played a game or two yourself in this variation. As you gain more experience, you'll realize that this is only scratching the surface of this eternal opening, and there's a lot more excitement and strategic complexity to discover.
When White castled, we noticed Black automatically followed suit. In this slower variation of the Italian game, there can be value in delaying castling. Now that White is committed to kingside castling, Black can remain flexible by playing d6, supporting the center and preparing to activate the light squared bishop. White may invest another tempo preventing this with h3, softening the castled kingside, but if White continues routinely with d3, this may lead to serious trouble after bishop g4, pinning White's knight. White may decide to return the favor with bishop g5, pinning Black's knight to the queen. Since White has already castled the king, the pin on f3 becomes quite serious after knight d4. If White continues to follow Black's strategy with knight d5, increasing the pressure against the pin knight, we can see how important it is to castle wisely, not automatically. The immediate knight takes f3 is a good choice, but Black can also confront White's knight with c6. If White retreats with knight e3, Black can seriously damage White's kingside defenses with knight takes f3 check. But if white decides to double black's pawns with knight takes f6 check, g takes f6. Since black's king remains in the center, opening the g-file will benefit black. White can decide to move the bishop to safety with bishop h4. But things start to quickly fall apart for white after knight takes f3 check, g takes f3. Ripping open the g-file, followed by bishop h3. Attacking white's rook, so after rook e1. White's king is terribly exposed on the g-file, and since black is not castled, this allows the crushing rook g8 check. King h1 leads to disaster after bishop g2 check, and it turns out white will suffer a similar fate after bishop g3. Blocking the check, but self-pinning the dark-squared bishop, black can exploit the pin by playing h5. Threatening to win a piece after h4, attacking the pin bishop, and trying to unpin the bishop with king h1 does not prevent black from playing the powerful h4. You know it's a bad sign when white's best response is to simply allow black to win a piece with h takes g3, because if white plays bishop takes h4, once again opening up the deadly g-file, black can play bishop g2 check, forcing the king back to the g-file. When black wins white's queen with bishop takes f3 check, attacking the queen while discovering the rook's check on the g-file, as we can see, although castling is generally a desirable idea, making this decision automatically can lead to serious trouble. Rather than castling automatically, inviting a ready-made attack on the king side, white can remain flexible with d3. When playing these positions as black, it's generally a reasonable plan to wait until white castles before committing the king to a particular side of the board. A flexible response is to simply play d6, supporting the center and waiting to see how white will continue. Instead of castling immediately, when bishop g4 may prove quite annoying, white can be the one to first deliver a pin with bishop g5. Black should not automatically castle, as this would lead to similar problems we just examined with knight d5, preparing to damage black's castled structure. Black can challenge white's bishop with h6. If white decides to surrender the bishop pair with bishop takes f6, queen takes f6. Notice that knight d5, Attacking the queen while threatening a fork on c7 is well met by queen d8. Now that there's no longer a knight on c3, white may focus on playing c3, preparing possible queenside expansion with b4 and a4, or support striking in the center with d4. Black may counter this by playing knight e7, adding pressure against the knight, and possibly preparing c6 with a roughly balanced game. Instead of capturing black's knight, White can maintain the tension with bishop h4. Dealing with this pin can be quite annoying, but since black hasn't committed to castling kingside, black can disturb the bishop once again with g5. Unpinning the f6 knight. The weakening g5 is not a move to be played lightly, and it's important to understand why white's piece sacrifice is unsound after knight takes g5. h takes g5, and bishop takes g5. This can look quite scary for black, especially as white is prepared to play moves such as knight d5 and queen f3, piling up the pressure against the pin knight. Once again, we can see the value of delaying kingside castling in this specific variation. Black can use the open g8 square to refute white's attack with rook g8. White can reinforce the bishop with h4, intending to play knight d5, intensifying the pressure against the pin knight. Black may continue with the provocative bishop g4, or defending d5 while confronting white's light-squared bishop with bishop e6, 
But the simplest way to put an end to White's unsound attack is with bishop b4, pinning the knight and preparing to counter queen f3 with the well-timed rook g6, supporting the pin knight when White lacks compensation for this unsound sacrifice. Knight takes g5 can be a serious problem if Black's king is committed to the king's side, but with Black's king in the center, White should avoid this move and simply retreat the bishop with bishop g3. Black may continue with a quick bishop g4, or first play the subtle a6, denying White's bishop access to the b5 square, so Black is threatening to gain the bishop pair with knight a5. White may respond in kind with a3, extending the a2 to g8 diagonal for White's bishop, when Black may continue actively with bishop g4, pinning the knight and preparing to meet h3 with bishop h5, maintaining the tension against the pinned knight when knight d4 is in the air. Black has extended the king's side pawns, which does restrict White's dark squared bishop, but g5 may also be subject to attack with h4, creating complex play as the kings remain flexible in the center. Knight c3 is less common at grandmaster level, although with proper play we notice there is certainly opportunity to develop interesting ideas. At this point White may decide to castle, try to gain more central control by offering a pawn with b4, known as the Evans Gambit, or rather than developing the knight, the c3 square can be used to prepare central expansion with c3. White prepares to strike in the center with d4, trying to create a powerful two-pawn center. Black typically continues by developing the king's side knight and adding pressure against White's center with knight f6. Instead of defending the e4 pawn, if White is in the mood to provoke immediate complications, then White may continue by striking in the center with d4, confronting Black's center. In order to hold the balance against this opening, Black must respond energetically, starting with e takes d4, c takes d4. White's two-pawn center can prove quite dangerous. Now that Black no longer has a pawn on e5, passive play may allow White to simply push Black off the board by advancing these pawns forward, harassing Black's knights. It's important to play as actively as possible with the disruptive bishop b4 check. We've reached a complex position, and several videos could be devoted to White's various options. In this introductory video, we'll briefly mention that if White blocks the check with bishop d2, the interested viewer can explore the tactical consequences that follow after knight takes e4 and bishop takes b4. But a solid place to start is bishop takes d2 check. White can recapture the bishop and support the e4 pawn with knight b takes d2. It's important that black does not casually castle or play a passive move, allowing white to stabilize the dangerous two-pawn center. Whenever possible, black should stay claim in the center with the pawn thrust d5, attacking white's light-squared bishop and breaking up the two-pawn center. After e takes d5 and knight takes d5, white now has an isolated d-pawn, but enjoys a lead in development. Now that the center has been opened, both sides should not grow too comfortable leaving their kings exposed in the center. Castling kingside is a natural path for both sides to explore. Another dynamic option to consider is queen b3, creating dangerous pressure against black center as well as the kingside, which is well met by knight a5, provoking sharp play. If white is not interested in exchanging bishops, one option to play is knight b to d2. This invites sharp complications if black is interested in playing knight takes e4, taking advantage of the pin knight and preparing to strike in the center with d5. So in response to knight takes e4, white is prepared to first play d5, grabbing space and trying to secure a significant lead in development. Once again, as you're starting out in the Italian, whenever possible, black's most reliable option is to strike in the center with a well-timed d5, breaking up white's two-pawn center when both sides will focus on castling and completing development. The Italian opening has a rich history, and analysis from the year 1620 is still relevant today. An active way to respond to the check is with knight c3. White does not obstruct the dark-squared bishop with this choice, once again threatening to advance the central pawns. Since white's knight on c3 is pinned, it's important for black to fight fire with fire by playing knight takes e4 dismantling white's two-pawn center while adding pressure against the pin knight. Capturing the e4 pawn with king still in the center is not a decision to take lightly, but if white tries to exploit this with queen e2, pinning the knight to the king, we can see black's thematic pawn thrust in action, d5, reclaiming an important share of the center. Notice that bishop takes d5 would simply lose a piece to queen takes d5, 
taking advantage of the pin knight on c3. Instead of pinning the knight with queen e2, we can time travel back to 1620 when the Italian analyst Greco suggested kingside castling. White is sacrificing material in order to rapidly develop, building a potentially dangerous time advantage. In one of Greco's examples, we can see an extreme case of material versus time, starting with the natural looking knight takes c3. B takes c3. Black should strike in the center with d5, but it's tempting to grab another pawn with bishop takes c3. White has already sacrificed two pawns and is only getting started. Bishop a3 is an interesting option to explore, but Greco preferred queen b3. Attacking the bishop while creating a dangerous battery against the f7 pawn. Once again, d5 is necessary to counter white's initiative and try to catch up on development, but after black captures the rook, black has accepted everything offered and is now completely losing. White's advantage in time is overwhelming after bishop takes f7 check. King f8. Bishop g5. Attacking the enemy queen, which is nearly trapped, black tries to defend the queen with knight e7. Capturing black's bishop on a1, or attacking the pin knight with rook e1 certainly are possible options, but Greco emphasized the coordination of his powerful pieces with knight e5. Bishop g6, threatening queen f7 checkmate is one interesting idea. And now that there is no longer a knight on f3, white is prepared to play queen f3, aligning with the enemy king. When black's undeveloped forces and weak king are no match against Greco's powerful piece play. Instead of capturing the knight with knight takes c3, a more reliable option for black is to play bishop takes c3. Rather than trying to capture as much material as possible, black focuses on reducing white's control over the key d5 square. The adventurous molar attack with d5 is a fascinating line to explore when black can retreat the endangered bishop with bishop f6, or consider knight e5, setting the stage for sharp complications. If white plays the natural b takes c3, the greedy knight takes c3 is immediately punished by queen e1 check, winning the knight. But black can ensure a solid game with d5. Black has successfully established a strong central presence, preparing to meet bishop d3, with kingside castling. After the smoke clears, black enjoys a solid position and should not face serious problems out of the opening. After e takes d4, the automatic c takes d4 allows a sharp struggle, although with careful play, black should be able to hold the balance with the active bishop b4 check. Another testing option that has been essayed at grandmaster level is e5, immediately taking advantage of the space left behind, challenging black's knight. This is an incredibly dangerous line to face without proper preparation, because natural moves such as knight e4 are punished by bishop d5. And knight g4 is met by, among other interesting choices, c takes d4, when black will have serious problems staying afloat. We mentioned earlier that black is often seeking the thematic pawn thrust d5, and once again, it's precisely this resource that holds the balance for black. When white plays the dangerous e5, it's important to remember the key central counter-strike, d5. At first glance this looks like a terrible move as it allows e takes f6, when after d takes c4, White can play f takes g7, attacking black's rook, so the rook defends itself with rook g8. It turns out that black is doing perfectly well, because if white decides to castle, queen f6, preparing to open up the g-file with queen takes g7, threatening checkmate on g2 is an excellent option for black. And black may also decide to immediately capture the pawn with rook takes g7, suddenly adding pressure against white's castled kingside, preparing to meet rook e1 check, with bishop e6. Notice knight g5, attempting to add pressure against the pinned piece, is well met with rook takes g5. So black is ready to move the queen and castle queenside, when white's king may prove more exposed to a dangerous attack. Since the tempting e takes f6 has not promised white anything special, countless grandmaster games have continued with bishop b5. Pinning the knight while moving the bishop to safety, when black centralizes the endangered knight with knight e4. White typically reclaims the pawn with c takes d4, thanks to the d5 pawn anchoring black center, instead of playing bishop b4 check, which is still possible, many grandmasters prefer to play bishop b6. Since white's central pawns are unable to favorably advance, black maintains the pressure against white's backward d4 pawn, emphasizing that white's central space advantage is not without some drawbacks as well. 
this is a roughly balanced position with plenty of interesting chances for both sides. The Italian is a strategically rich opening, and although c3 appears to prepare d4, white may also decide to avoid these forcing, concrete lines by defending the e4 pawn with d3. Many grandmasters have revisited the Italian game, especially as the Berlin defense and martial attack have caused their fair share of headaches for white in the Rui Lopez. It may seem strange to combine c3 with d3. Just because white played d3 doesn't mean d4 isn't still a possibility, and white will often seek to expand in the center with precisely this move once white has completed development. For example, after d6. With the knight on c3, we learned how automatically castling can quickly lead to disaster with careless play. Even though the knight on b1 appears restricted with the pawn on c3, this can actually favor white. There are no shortage of ideas to explore, including bishop b3, the immediate knight b to d2, and in this case, white can comfortably castle. If black decides to pin the knight with bishop g4, thanks to the c3 pawn, this is less dangerous as black is unable to add more pressure against the pinned knight with knight d4. White can decide to question the bishop with h3, provoking bishop h5, when the light-squared bishop may prove quite misplaced on the king side. One theme to keep in mind is the space gaining a4. If black isn't paying attention, then b4 followed by a5 will trap black's bishop. In response to a4, a6, or a5 both have their pros and cons. Let's say that black plays a5, grabbing space and discouraging b4 at the expense of weakening the b5 square. We can now see white's queenside knight enter the action with a thematic maneuver, knight b to d2. After black castles, white can centralize the rook with rook e1, preparing to complete the queenside knight's instructive journey after queen d7. With knight f1, white's knight prepares to find activity on the king side, so if black plays h6, preventing bishop g5, white can play knight g3, attacking the light-squared bishop, so after bishop g6, the light-squared bishop is restricted by white's pawns. White's knight on g3 eyes the f5 square, which may later be supported by the other knight with knight h4, gaining a tempo against black's bishop, which continues to prove misplaced. This is the sort of quieter Italian game position, maintaining plenty of tension in pieces on the board, that can allow the more experienced player to outplay an opponent less comfortable with subtle maneuvering games. Since bishop g4 is less challenging without a possible knight d4 threat, black will do well to delay the decision deciding how to activate this piece. As is the case with white, there are plenty of options to consider, including simply castling kingside. One interesting and popular choice is to play a6. This subtle pawn move allows a future bishop a7, securing the bishop on this desirable diagonal, especially if the center suddenly opens. a6 may support a future b5, but a6 also prevents white's bishop from using the b5 square. This may allow black to gain the bishop pair in the future with knight a5, but with the bishop on c5, this is not yet a threat as white can play bishop takes f7 check, followed by forking the two minor pieces with b4. As black is taking a moment to secure the dark-squared bishop, in addition to moves such as a4, white can take a moment to secure the light-squared bishop with bishop b3. White's bishop remains flexible on the a2 to g8 diagonal, preparing to move to c2 if necessary. In response to bishop b3, black may decide to castle, or first move the bishop to its favorite hideout on a7. This move may look a little strange, but the bishop remains active on the diagonal, while also feeling a bit more secure than it was on c5. If white eventually plays d4, which is often the case, this no longer attacks the dark-squared bishop, allowing black more flexibility with how to handle the center. The Italian game is an incredibly subtle opening, with seemingly an endless amount of move orders available for both sides. Let's take a look at a common line starting with knight b to d2. We've seen this knight maneuver before, and it's a common idea to keep in mind. After black castles, it's possible to play rook e1, but black's knight can join the dark-squared bishop's pressure against f2 with knight g4. The rook can move to e2 with a perfectly reasonable position, but white can also prevent this possibility by first playing h3. Black may respond in kind with h6, when white continues as expected with rook e1 supporting the center while clearing the f1 square for white's typical knight maneuver. Black has a variety of options that are worth exploring, including immediately confronting white's light-squared bishop with bishop e6, intensifying the struggle over the center. 
Preparing this with rook e8, followed by bishop e6 is a solid way to continue. Focusing for central control is a great idea, but black can also focus on the king side with the interesting option knight h5, eyeing the f4 and g3 squares. h3 has weakened the g3 square, so notice g3 would be a terrible mistake, not only because it hangs the pawn on h3. Black can simply play knight takes g3, taking advantage of the pinned f2 pawn. Moving the knight to h5 temporarily makes this piece loose, and as it's aligned with white's queen, it's important to understand what happens if white plays knight takes e5, capturing a pawn while revealing the queen's pressure against the undefended knight. This turns out to be a serious mistake as black can play queen h4. Don't forget about black's bishop hiding on a7. It joins the queen in attacking the f2 square. White cannot both defend the threatened knight on e5, as well as the f2 pawn so knight takes c6 is well met by queen takes f2 check. Black will regain the piece after b takes c6 when white's fractured kingside is under tremendous pressure. As the overly ambitious knight takes e5 backfires for white, a more sensible choice is knight f1. Notice how the knight on h5 restrains the typical plan of knight g3 for the moment. In some cases the knight may move to h2, supporting the other knight, as well as eyeing the g4 square. The knight also helps support bishop e3, which we'll see in a moment. Black's knight on h5 does not want to linger on the square forever, often preparing to leap into the f4 square. We see these ideas in action after black's typical continuation, queen f6, supporting the center while also preparing knight f4. White continues developing and fights for central control with bishop e3. When black's knight invades enemy territory with knight f4, White has a variety of options, including the typical knight g3. White sometimes plays king h2, supporting the h3 pawn while vacating the g1 square for other pieces to use. White's most direct continuation is d4, expanding in the center while increasing tension against the e5 pawn. Since black's queen supports e5, this allows black to play the instructive maneuver, knight e7, preparing to support the king side while also opening up the c7 pawn. In some cases, black tries to play c6, preparing d5. But another idea is to strike against white's two-pawn center with c5. Now that black's knight is no longer protecting g3, this is a good moment to continue with knight g3. When black also completes a useful knight maneuver with knight e to g6, supporting the center, the other knight on f4, and possibly considering a future knight h4 if it proves desirable to offer an exchange of knights. White can grab more space on the queen side with a4, but another instructive option is bishop c2. It may appear strange to move this bishop to a seemingly less active diagonal, but it serves an important role. The bishop supports the center, as well as a future knight f5, increasing pressure against black's king side. This is a typical Italian game position filled with peace tension. In fact, we are on move 15 without a single pawn or peace capture thus far. Black can make quiet improvements such as rook e8, supporting the center, or strike against the hotly contested d4 square with c5. In this case, white can grab more central space with d5, allowing black to claim space on the queen side with c4, setting the stage for a tense positional struggle. As is the case with many quiet variations of the Italian, white enjoys a slightly more comfortable game, but black's position remains solid with plenty of chances for both sides. The Italian game is one of the oldest and most respected openings in chess. We can find beginners and amateurs playing it due to straightforward piece play, as well as central control. But grandmasters also gravitate toward this opening, appreciating its strategic complexity, as well as trying to build slight but persistent positional advantages to outplay their lower-rated opponents and also challenge their grandmaster colleagues. The Italian can be a quieter, slower-paced maneuvering battle, but it can also embrace its romantic roots with aggressive central play that can result in quick wins against unprepared opponents. The Italian is a rich opening that can serve you for a lifetime, and as we noted, Black has no shortage of interesting resources to add to the conversation. Thanks for exploring the Italian game, and best of luck the next time this opening makes an appearance in one of your games.